UAB MedCast is an ongoing medical education podcast. The UAB Division of Continuing Education designates that each episode of this enduring material is worth a maximum of 0.25 AMA PRA Category 1 credit. To collect credit, please visit uabmedicine.org slash medcast and complete the episode's post-test. Welcome to UAB MedCast, a continuing education podcast for medical professionals. Bringing knowledge to your world. Here's Melanie Cole. The interventional cardiology team at UAB Hospital recently added to its long-standing reputation as a pioneer in the development and impl- implementation of stents by becoming the first in Alabama to offer patients with coronary artery disease a new treatment option that disappears over time. My guest today is Dr. Mark Sass. He's an associate professor and an interventional cardiologist at UAB Medicine. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sass. What is the current standard for stent implantation as it stands now? The current uh, standard is using either is using metal stents. Uh, the original stents that we used were uh, bare metal stents that did not have a dr- uh, that did not have drug elution on them, and they were originally made of uh, stainless steel. And since they had high restenosis rates. Uh, they were not used as widely as they were before um, because they just failed at about a 20 to 30 percent rate. Uh, then uh, we developed drug eluting stents, and they were, again, originally stainless steel with a uh, polymer that had a drug coating on them, and they reduced restenosis probably to about 5 to 7 percent. And now we have a new generation of stents that are cobalt and chromium, and the other uh, uh, stent group is one that's made out of cobalt and platinum, and they also have uh, drug coating on them, and they, again, reduce the restenosis rate to about uh, 5 to 7 percent. The only problem is is that they're made of metal, and that the metal uh, lasts forever, and it stays within the artery forever, so that's the downside of that. So those are used in the majority of cases. In our group, interventional cardiology group, we probably stated that we would use these standard uh, stents in approximately 90% of our cases. And now with the advent of bioabsorbable stents, ones that, quote, disappear, um, we will probably use those in a greater proportion of uh, patients. But there are only certain subsets of patients that we can use them really safely in those groups because they were not studied in the uh, kind of more uh, in sicker patient populations and in patients with more difficult coronary disease. So we've kind of, at least here, been trying to be as close to the original studies uh, that were performed in the United States. Um, However, uh, in Europe, they've been using them for many years in much greater uh, uh, and wider patient populations, ones with they overlap the stents, which we have tended not to do in the initial phases of using these, uh, using them in heavily calcified arteries um, uh, for uh, uh, treatment of lesions that are also uh, longer, more calcified, and uh, more difficult as far as their anatomy. Uh, So now, with greater experience, we may be using them, but those are not the patients in the original studies. So what would be the criteria for patients or contraindications for using the absorbed bioresorbable vascular coronary stent? The group of patients that it's used for is um, patients with kind of relatively healthy vessels, ones that have plaques that are severely narrowing the artery but not heavily calcified. Uh, They should meet certain um, minimum uh, diameter criteria. The stent uh, is best served in vessel sizes that are about three up to four millimeters. Once they're starting to be smaller, the stents, they don't have stents in that size. And then also the there's a potential for a greater risk of stent thrombosis. So in those populations that have 
bigger vessels or smaller vessels, we tend to use the uh, standard bare metal stents. Um, the uh, the other group that we are also thinking about using them, though, is that there may be, tend to be maybe younger patients where if they have a significant lesion and that down the road we're hoping that the stent will disappear and then they'll regain their vasomotor reactivity, which is the kind of, the kind of, kind of compliance and kind of uh, softness of the vessel that may be lost if you kind of if you put a, a, a metal stent in because the metal stent is very rigid and then the vessel kind of loses its ability to react like a normal vessel without a stent. So the groups that would I that at least I would consider uh, the ones that I've done uh, is the ones that are younger have bigger vessels, less complex anatomy. The problem with the bare metal stents, when I say less complex, with the um, bioabsorbable stents, is that they're, they're scaffolds, they're not metal, so we can't post-dilate the stent as much as we would with a true metal stent. So we have to use, we have to kind of assess the vessel a little bit uh, better uh, prior to putting them in, making sure that there's not heavy calcification uh, because we may not be able to expand the stent as well as we would if we had a uh, metal stent in there that has, a, that has a greater radial strength. So do you think as technology changes, dissolving stents will still have these drawbacks compared to metallic stents? I think there's always going to be those drawbacks because in order for it to disappear, it, it the just uh, chemically because it's a salt uh, that it's going to absorb and uh, it's just not going to be as rigid. So there's these populations that have heavy calcium, heavy um, uh, fibrous tissue in there that may not even that even makes regular metal stents difficult to expand so those would oh there's always going to be those patient populations which would not be ideal uh, candidates for uh, a bio uh, resorbable scaffold does the medical management after stent implantation change with the absorbed bioresorbable stent the initial management is uh, the same. It's uh, aspirin indefinitely, like every patient with coronary disease. However, uh, we're hoping in the if with long, long-term studies, we don't have to be as aggressive with dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, groups that uh, feel that longer dual antiplatelet therapy in certain patient subsets is advisable. There, our current FDA uh, recommendation is to have dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin, or other uh, agents such as Prosegrel, Ticagrelor, or Plavix for at least one year. European recommendations are six months. Um, however, if you have a longer stented segment or, or, or you have stented a smaller segment that may have a greater risk of stent thrombosis, you may want to continue the Plavix for longer than one year, even up to two years. Some people do indefinitely, especially if there is a, um, if the patient came in with like a uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction and they put in a long stent, then sometimes we kind of look at the patient and say, well, you're at higher risk of stent thrombosis. You haven't had any bleeding complications, so therefore we may continue it longer. But if and that is just because we're always worried about stent thrombosis. Stent thrombosis is when the platelets attract to the uh, the metal that may not be endothelialized properly. So if it's not endothelialized properly, we're always worried that a uh, that about stent thrombosis. So this is our greatest fear as interventional cardiologists. So hopefully in the long term, if you have a stent that technically disappears, we may be able to get away with less aggressive dual antiplatelet therapy because we have seen in multiple studies that it, it, the longer the patients are on dual antiplatelet therapy, their increased 
they have increased risk of bleeding. And increased risk of bleeding is always associated with a poorer outcome. And in just the last few minutes, how can a community physician refer a patient to UAB Medicine? I mean, the uh, any if they are interested in doing that, they can always call the MIST line. Uh, that's um, the MIST line. It gets us in contact with um, our uh, with any of the interventional cardiologists, especially the interventional cardiologists online, or they can refer through the clinic to any one of uh, to myself or any of the other uh, my colleagues if they want to. Um, have an outpatient clinic visit. A lot of the times for stents, uh, it's it's always difficult because if they get a catheterization at an outside hospital, they um, the, the patient wants it done at that time. So we would have to consider that a little bit more carefully up front if they're considering a bioabsorbable stent. Tell us about your team at UAB Medicine. Why is it so great to work with them? The, the the reason is is that I think uh, again it's a uh, large hospital with a very diverse uh, patient population. So we deal with um, uh, from the just uh, regular cardiology patients uh, who have uh, relatively typical coronary disease, all the way up to very uh, to patients with heart transplants, with uh, kidney transplants, liver transplants. So we take care of very complex patients. So we see a gambit of different types of disease processes that make us, I think, even a better um, uh, interventionalist. And then also because we're a teaching institution, we're constantly uh, teaching our, our, our fellows and, and medical students and, and kind of being on the cutting edge of technology. And then also I think that we we have our, um, our, our section chief, uh, Dr. Lisar, has made it a, a point to use a lot of imaging, uh, IVIS and OCT and, uh, and fractional flow reserve measurements. So we can really assess the, we have a great expertise in assessing vessels, uh, their size, their degree of calcium. So I think in that respect, uh, we're an ideal center to uh, assess um, uh, patients for absorbable stents. It's not that other people don't do that in the community, but we have, uh, we do a, 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 a significant amount of uh, adjunct imaging prior to putting in stents. And I think just because um, our section chief has uh, published widely about that and we have learned a lot from each other about how to put these stents in and how to do all of these uh, adjunct imaging studies while we're putting in stents. So I think it, it boils down to is that we're a teaching institution. We have a very wide uh, patient population that really makes us experts in all types of coronary disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Sass. It's great information. You're listening to UAB MedCast. For more information on resources available at UAB Medicine, you can go to uabmedicine.org slash physicians. That's uabmedicine.org slash physician. This is Melanie Cole. Thanks so much for listening.